And welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself, I want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, this is, I believe, our 26th program, which makes it exactly a half a year that we've been doing this. Hmm. In Search of Christianity for half a year? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That went fast. And the search is not over yet. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we're going to start and pick up where we left off. Last week we were talking about holiness. A very good topic indeed. And if you missed that, please go on the Bible Talk website or on InSearchOfChristianity.com and, and take the half hour to look at that. It's an important topic. It's a very important subject. And you, you need to hear it. Yes. It'll give you something to think about. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Brother Mark to ask God's blessing on our time here on this program. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for your word. And may you just pour it upon us and that we may drink from it and learn from it and put it in our hearts to spread it around. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Okay, as I said, last week we were talking about holiness. Excuse yes. me a second. <laughs> I love you too. Okay. Yes, we just had our anniversary. Yeah, we just had our 48th wedding anniversary. Okay. Let's get down to business here. All right. We were talking about holiness, as I said. And I, when we started, I said, I'm going to try and I want to connect three things. Holiness, humility, and happiness. Okay. So in this program, we're going to focus more on, on uh, humility. Okay, because indeed, it's a truth that holiness and humility have a symbiotic relationship. They feed off of one another. One builds the, each, each of these two things build each other. Mm -hmm. This is a case of that the, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. Mm -hmm. Right? It's, this is one plus one equals lots. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I need to start this by just sharing a little bit of my, my testimony. And I know I've shared this a lot of times, but it's important to this topic. I've talked about the fact that before I was saved, and when I was not saved, I was very unsaved. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is I had been successful in the world, and I had a massive, massive ego. That's code for pride. Or as my dear brother, who is now going on to be with the Lord, Arthur Burt, used to say, Damnable pride. Okay. And on my 33rd birthday, which was 39 years ago, 39 years ago, Yowza. Yowza. I had an encounter with the risen Lord. Yes, you did. And to try and put this as succinctly as possible, as I said, I had a, I had a massive pride, and um, I felt wonderful about myself compared to everybody else that I knew. I mean, we had all the toys. I had a, a phenomenal job in Manhattan back when Manhattan was the business center of the world. And I just really felt good about myself. Except when I would go out on a starry night and look up into the sky, and I would literally feel crushed. Mm -hmm. I would look into the, the sky, and I would look up at the stars. You know, light that was, this is the way I thought then, you know, just millions or billions of years old. And here I am, and I thought back then, if I lived to be 50, that would be an amazing feat. Just turned 72, by the way, so I made it past the 50. Another story. So that would crush me. It would literally get me depressed. Yes, it would. I mean, Alice can attest to that fact. On this birthday, I sat down as Alice and her sister went out to get a birthday cake for my birthday, and I was sitting at my kitchen table having a cup of coffee, and I looked up, and there on the on the refrigerator was a Bible. Now, I had been raised in a religious family. Never read the Bible. Never, ever, ever. No. But Alice had gotten saved a month before this event mm -hmm. and came home and started talking to me about Jesus. And I said, I just don't want to hear that. Um, 
But I looked up and I saw that Bible that she had brought in and I went over for whatever reason and I said, Jesus, if you are real, I want to know. And I sat down at the table and I just flipped the Bible open and I flipped the Bible open and I looked down and I saw these words. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? And I heard a voice, maybe just, I don't know, was it just in my, in my ears or just in my heart? But I heard a voice that said to me, not only am I real, but I know exactly what's in your heart. And I sat that, there that day, and I had a radical, life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ. And he said to me at the end of this, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but he said to me, you've had your life, now it's mine. And that has been the case for these past 39 years. Mm. I've shared that testimony in a lot of places, but I was actually preaching one place, and I was sharing that testimony, and in the middle of that, what I was talking about, the Lord stopped me, and he said, you're wrong. Now, if anybody out there has ever preached the gospel, stood behind a pulpit, and uh, I don't know if you can understand what an experience it is to be preaching to a congregation and all of a sudden have God tell you, no, you're wrong. So that stopped me dead in my tracks, and I excused myself from the congregation, turned around to have a little chat with Jesus. And he said to me, it was not the moon, it was not the stars that humbled you. It was the awesome holiness of the Creator. It says in Psalms, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. It was God's glory, His awesome holiness that humbled me. You know, it says in 1 Peter, Peter wrote, moved by the Holy Spirit, 1 Peter 5, he said, You younger men likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. I want to tell you something. If you have pride in your life, it's not that God's just not going to bless you. He is opposed to you. Yes. There are a lot of Christians running around, and they don't even understand why things are going wrong, or in their life, you know, things are happening, and they say, oh, it's the devil, it's this, this. It may be God. Mm -hmm. You know, the Word of God says, that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That's true, unless that weapon is in the hand of God. Thank you. And if you're wandering and walking in pride, God is opposed to you. Just... Just meditate on that a bit. So anyhow, God wants us to be humbled so that he can exalt us. It's a purpose to this. You know, the Apostle Paul stated that we do, we behold the glory of God. But he said we behold the glory of God as through a mirror. And then he went on, and we see his majestic holiness. But he also said in 1 Corinthians 13, for now we see in a mirror dimly. I want to tell you that pride, self, is like a fog that dims and blurs our vision of the one who is holy. Yes. You know, and it says that when we see Jesus as he is, we will be as he is. The less clearly you see him, the less like, you're, like him you're going to be. All right? Pride is like a fog that stands between you and Christ. We are supposed to see Jesus clearly. We're supposed to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. That's what it says in Hebrews 12, too. And Jesus said, now, think about this. Jesus said, I, I think I quoted this verse last week, Come to me, yes. all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Jesus is humble. Now, he's, he's giving us a command to come and learn from him. You know, he is the truth. If you want to learn the truth, it's going to have to be through Jesus Christ. But let me talk about for a moment about the paradox here. And there is a paradox. Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords. 
He is the King of Kings. Yes, he, is. he is the King of Glory. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, who was and is and who is to come. That's what we're talking about. Yes. The great I am. But it's written, Paul wrote, you know, in, in Philippians, that he, Jesus, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. How can he be all these magnificent things and be humble? But in that verse, in Philippians chapter 2, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. he, can, Paul continues to say, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. The purpose of humility is that we, like Jesus before us, might be exalted and lifted up. See, that's the idea. Okay? And that we might be as he is holy. God, God, God's not trying to put burden on you. That's why he said his burden, his, his yoke, his burden. It's, he's not trying to oppress us. He's trying to set us free. He has set us free. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed, right? But James said, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. James 4.10. Peter said it. Peter said, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. 1 Peter 5.6. And Paul went on, and Paul said, for our citizenship is in heaven. Good to think of it in this particular time. Mm -hmm. From which also we eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of power that he has even to subject all things to himself. The purpose is he wants to transform our humble state to conform it into the body of his glory you know the enemy of God's plan that's God's plan mm -hmm. you know it, it, Paul wrote in Romans and said you know Romans 8 29 he said that whom he foreknew he pre yes. predestined to be conformed into the image of his son Christ Jesus but the enemy of God's plan is self-esteem mm -hmm. thinking about ourselves thinking highly of ourselves and that self-esteem is so precious to the world today, so nurtured by the world today. That self-esteem is not only taught in all of our schools and worshipped in our culture, and it is indeed worshipped in our culture. Yes. It has become the message that is preached from thousands of pulpits every single week in the Western world. Churches in the Western world. Right? It has to be. You know, Paul talked about that in his letter to Timothy, second letter to Timothy, because he said, in the last days, men will hold to a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof, right? But the thing, but before he says that, he said, but realize this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of self. That's the first one. And it is the gateway to the rest, all right? right. Second Timothy 3, that was the first Pride and second is the first. gateway to all sin. Pride is indeed the gateway to all sin. And you know, pride indeed can even come disguised as humility. Yes, it can. Because mm -hmm. you get proud of your humility. <laughs> All right? So I, I just want to say this, and I pray that you've seen or, or heard enough of me to understand that I don't, I don't say this, I don't say anything for condemnation. Mm -hmm. I pray that it's for, for encouragement and correction, okay? Right. Um, I mentioned what's going on in so many, so many pulpits today. That's a fact. I mean, that's just a, just a fact. And it's not new. I mean, go read how God spoke of the quote-unquote shepherds of Israel right. back in, in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, right? Woe to the shepherds. So I want to say this to the quote-unquote church leaders of today. Before you get so proud of yourself because you are, you're the one that everybody's looking at come Sunday, right? Mm. I want to remind you of this. And this goes to our conversation about holiness last week. God can make dirt holy. Mm. That's right. He did when Moses showed up. He said, the ground just standing on is holy. That's right. He can make dirt holy. He can speak through a donkey <laughs> like he did with Balaam That's right. in the time of Balak. That's right. So don't get too uppity. Don't get too uppity. If any man boasts, let him boast in the Lord. You know, there are six things that the Lord hates. 
yea, even seven that are an abomination to him. And the first one of those is haughty eyes, pride. That's, that's from Proverbs chapter 6. Go read it. Proverbs 6, 16, 16, 17, and on. He hates it. God is love. Don't for a moment think that there are not things that God hates. And pride is first and foremost. Why? Because he came. God the Father sent Jesus Christ to bring life. While the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. His first weapon is pride. Isn't that what he played upon with Eve, and the, with the woman in the garden? Yes. All right? Like I said, my, my dear brother who has gone on before us, Arthur Burt, used to call it damnable pride. Mm -hmm. Pride goes before destruction. Haughty eyes before a fall. All right? Satan wants you to fall. Yes. Satan wants you to collapse. He wants you to drop dead on the ground. He does not want you to be holy. He does not want you to be free. He does not want you to be joyful. He does not want you to have love. He doesn't want you to have peace. So his tool, I promise you, is pride. And pride is insidious. It's always, always, always pushing, trying to get in. Trying to get in. God desires you to be holy. It takes humility. But as you focus on the holiness of God, because we're supposed to take part in His holiness, that's got to humble you. Yes. Because there's one thing that will humble you. I mean, it's not like some, you know, kind of trying to whip the flesh on your back to read. You know what, what will cause you to truly come to a place of humility? It's fixing your eyes on Jesus Christ. Being in the presence of our God. Because how in the world... Can you possibly come and be in the presence of God and focus on your own pride? And yet, and yet, in the Sermon on the Mount that I talk about so much here, at the end, towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, many, not a few, he said, many will come to me on that day, that final day, and will say, Lord, Lord, look what we did in your name. We cast out demons. We did this. We did that. How can you come into the presence? How can you come into the presence of the living, risen Jesus Christ, standing there with nail-scarred hands open to greet you and say to him, look what I did? And his response to those people was, depart from me, you evil ones. I never knew you. I promise you there is such danger in pride. The key to humility is helplessness. What do you think of that? Before you go on to that one, I was just thinking about these people that go before the Lord. They have to be totally consumed with pride. Because totally they, consumed because in the presence of God, there's nothing that they're, I mean, the, the power of God isn't penetrating them at all. So they have to be totally, what's an absolutely consumed with pride. Pride means that you can do it yourself. You're usually self-sufficient. Being, what did you say? Uh, that word, and you said, how about that? I can't remember all the way back then. <laughs> Write to us at office at BibleTalk.com and remind me of what I said a couple of minutes ago. You could watch the video, but... <clears throat> no, it, it, it consumes you. It does. The, the fact of the matter is, but think about it. it, it it's based on a false doctrine, a doctrine of works. Yes, yes. Okay? Yes. Where you think that you are made right with God because of the works that you do. And when that happens, you begin to you begin to boast in your works, which is exactly what they did. They come into the presence of God saying, look what we did. And Paul makes it so clear. The scriptures all make it so clear. Right? Those works are as filthy rags before the Lord if you're taking credit for them. Okay? The glory has to go to God. He will not share Absolutely. that glory. Not at all. Mm -mm. Okay? So when you are in that place where you are giving all of the glory, all of the honor to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to have that problem because you can't take credit for what he is doing in you That's and what he is doing through you. That's right. It's him. It's all him. We are the work of his hands. But all of a sudden, a salvation or a relationship with God that is based on what you have done, that, that is such deceit. And if you believe that for a minute, you have been deceived by that one who is a liar by nature and the father of lies. Mm -hmm. 
It is God's amazing grace. And only God's amazing grace. And I want to tell you something. God doesn't owe you a thing. I don't care. I don't care if you've been a missionary in Bongo, Bongo, Pora, Bora, and had your toes cut. I don't care what you have done for the Lord. The glory still belongs to him. And not one thing you have done has earned you salvation. Not one thing. That doesn't mean that it's not a good thing to do those things. We're, we're to present ourselves a living and holy sacrifice. And everything we do is for the Lord, not for us. For his honor. For his honor. For, for his, his glory. glory. Let's go back. And again, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said you know, that we are to do our good works before men in such a way that they see them and give glory to God. That's right. Not to us. That's right. Because that's what stands in the way that will keep you from holiness. Yes, it will. That lack of humility will absolutely keep you from holiness. You have to become invisible. It is. So now let me just say what I said a minute ago. Mm -hmm. Not the thing you asked about. <laughs> the key to humility is understanding that true humility is helplessness. That was it. Okay, that's it. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> you no longer have to write. Okay. <laughs> but you can anyhow. Yes. Helplessness. But there's a big difference between helplessness and hopelessness. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay? Yes. We have a hope. Hallelujah. We have a hope that is the anchor of our souls. We yes. have the great hope. I mean, this is every tribulation, every trial that you experience in life builds to hope. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 5. It's all about, you know, that's why we exult in our tribulations. Because it leads to perseverance, perseverance to proven character, and proven character to hope. And hope does not fail. That's what the Word of God says, all right? Think of David, a man after God's own heart, okay? He said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. It's not that he thought he could handle it. No. It's that he knew that he wasn't alone. He said, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It's the presence of God that he depended on, not himself. He didn't think that he could handle it. He thought that the one he was with could handle anything. Think about when he met Goliath on the field of battle. All right? Now, I mean... What a sight. Before he went out on the battlefield, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, bear not beer, no. <laughs> he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Yes. He knew that. He said, God's going to deliver me. But he's not relying on his own strength. Because if you read that account in 1 Samuel 17, now I'm sure you all heard the story, but have you gone there and studied it and heard what God has to say, all right? When the Philistine looked and saw David, remember David is a youth, right? Mm -hmm. So it says, Goliath disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed God, cursed David by his gods. Mm -hmm. How'd that work out for that old big guy? Don't be afraid of what people have cursed. The only word that should have any impact on you is the word of God. Mm -hmm. And you repeating it. Okay. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Now that's what most people consider a tribulation. <laughs> But David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you, and I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Hallelujah. He wasn't relying on himself. And if you rely on yourself, pow, you're going to fall flat. That's right. The prophet Zechariah spoke. You know the prophet Zechariah? Have you read that lately? And he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, but it's the word of the Lord to you, it's the word of the Lord to me, saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's not your strength. It's not your power. It is the Spirit of God. Jesus himself, having emptied himself and humbled himself, said, 
I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own, but the will of the Father who sent me. We can and we should say that same thing today, as well as what saying what Paul said right after when he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's nothing that you face in life that you can't deal with if it is God who is dealing with you, dealing with you at that place and at that time. We're helpless of ourselves, but filled with power from on high through the Lord. We're helpless, but not hopeless. Mm -hmm. Remember last week we talked about, we closed it, last week we were talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, yes. right? You want to talk fire. about <laughs> fire, fire, humility. It says in Daniel chapter 3, 3, 16 and 17, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Talking about bowing down before that statue and worshiping it. If that is the case, talking about getting thrown into the fire, they don't worship. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Humility can appear to the world as arrogance. Here's three young men standing up to the most powerful king on the world at the time. All right? Would that appear arrogant? It was the epitome of humility because they were bowing before the Lord God Almighty. It's because of who you serve. You are a king's kid, a child of God. You are an ambassador of Christ, the work of his hands and the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's a, my goodness gracious, that is God exalting you. So I pray to teach us, O oh Lord, to disciple us so that we would say, like David did, my soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. And Jeremiah said, thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts of this, that he understands and knows me. Jeremiah chapter 9. The Apostle Paul said it very simply. He said, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. The purpose of this is that we would share in his holiness. All of this is designed to bring us to one place. To bring us to that place where we are conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. To be pure, to be holy, to be perfected in him. That comes through that process. Remember that all of the things going on in your life, all of the trials, all of the tribulations, all of the tests have a purpose. And that purpose is to refine you with a refiner's fire. Refiner's fire. And when you can bow before the will of God and give thanks in all things, for it is indeed the will of God for you in Christ Jesus, when you can rejoice, when you can exult, when you can consider it all joy, you will find holiness coming to fruit in your life, to bear fruit in your life. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that you are at work to will your good pleasure, to will and to work your good pleasure in our lives. Lord, that you are molding us continually and shaping us, bringing us from glory to glory, bringing us into that place of holiness, bringing us into that perfect humility where, Lord, we disappear and you are what's visible in our lives. That, Lord, all that we do in our lives would be for your glory. I pray that, Father, in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Till next time, God bless you. Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old cross where the dearest and best are a world of lost sinners.